Thank you. Yeah. Bom dia, pessoal. Bem-vindos a Coimbra. Essa palestra vai ser em português. Eu espero que todo mundo me acompanhe. Quick joke. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. So I'm Vinicius. I'm a FreeBSD parts committer and also part of the core team of the Tor project. I use FreeBSD for quite a while. I started in the version five. So I got like the, the easy way of that. And yeah, this is a continuation of the, the talk that I gave in the 2021 about auto installing the BSD systems. In the previous talk, I mentioned how you can install Net, Open, FreeBSD and Dragonfly. So here I'm extending that to PFSense through NAS and giving you um, option that I use in one of my personal setups that you can remote unlock your root encrypted file system. So this will be our agenda. I put it in TRDR in the top. We go through the installers, then I will mention my setup, ELK, and at the end some demonstrations. So here I leave the, the links in the presentation you can you can have and watch uh, later and the slides are there. This was in the, the other conference. So quick disclaimer of course if you want you can do your personal and different approach of doing the setup. If you do not want to use the IPXC setup that I will present here you can basically use the tools that you have in the, the base repository in the source, build your own image either uh, Manstick or ISO image and for FreeBSD only I'm talking here uh, put the configuration file in it so when you boot you have your auto installer reading the config and auto installing the system so long story short you have the ISO and Manstick images that are already providing you in the download.freebsd.org you can get them mount just inject your file in the in the image, build that again in your custom ISO or Minstick, and boot it. So you don't need to have the IPXE or Pixie setup uh, if you don't want to have that. So that's uh, uh, one solution for that. And yeah, in the first presentation, I gave an example using Puppet. So if you want to keep using Puppet, use Puppet. If you want to use Ansible, use Ansible. It's your choice. Um, like in the first presentation, I mentioned IPixie, and here I added like five five slides more about that because I got some some questions through email and IRC. Um, I will try to cover a little bit more from what I said in the in the previous talk. So, IPixie, you can use it to like boot an operating system via network. And I'm using this, this project here, I really like it. You can uh, combine some scripting support as it has, uh, put into your needs to let's say, boot certain machines into your DNS VLAN, into your web VLAN, into your email VLAN, and so on and so on. You can boot uh, ISO images and yeah, combine a lot of things that you, you want to create for your setup. It has IPv6 support, it's pretty neat. It has also uh, support for uh, HTTPS and TLS. Here you see uh, that I mentioned only uh, 1.2 uh, support for the TLS. Uh, the project can do 1.3, but now it's, as far as I know, it's not supported yet. They need to get some investments because it takes time for, for the developers to, to invest in time and resources on building that. Uh, these are the ciphers algorithms that they, they, they support. Here's the, the official page from I got that information. And IPixie you can also use to combine uh, a nice feature that is if you have your binaries that you want to boot, you can sign them. And you only boot them when you verify that the binary corresponds to the signature and then you start your open system. So they use this uh, image trust and then they, they, they verify if the signature corresponds to the binary and then they will kick off. Um, root certificates, if you want to have a self-signed certificate, your own CA, you can have that. 
in the FreeBSD port we allow that. You can you can specify uh, some extra variables in the environment and customize your setup to have your own CA for that case. By default, the IPXE has its uh, root CA, which uh, cross signs the Mozilla certificates. To let's say that, so in in practical, it uses and trusts the same certificates as a Firefox browser. Is that too fast? Making sense? Any questions? All good. Because I'm trying to fit the 40 minutes. <laughs> Last time I'm talking like that. No problem. So this is a example of a very basic uh, configuration for the iPixie. Uh, you get the IP addresses and all the things from the ACP. You don't really need to have this. You're just printing what you got from the ACP. Then you're syncing your clock. And the last command, you're booting this image uh, via network using HTTPS. This is again uh, the netboot uh, project I mentioned in the first talk. If you want to get more from them, you go to, of course, their websites or have a look on the streamings from the last presentation. So that uh, configuration file gives us this. Here you can also see signature checks enable. So they do this thing, the sign it binary, do the verification of the signature, and then you only boot that if it corresponds to the, to, to the right signature. Another configuration file, as an example, example, you have the base config that you want to uh, kind of, let's say, include in your other files. And you load this file if you have a host name set for the machine. Uh, or uh, you, you see here the two pipes. Or uh, you get the file with a MAC address for the machine. Or if you don't find any of those specific configuration files, you boot into a default uh, menu that you create. And in my case, this is what I have for me. So I can uh, boot and install slash auto install Dragonfly FreeBSD Elk, which is my thing there, PFSense, TrueNAS, and the other ones. So I have this uh, extra tools and utilities that I also can boot from home. Uh, quick mention to the projects read their copyrights for specific for those two projects, which if they're not allowing you to do some particular changes, just don't or write to them, ask for permission, and yeah, do your thing. The image that I use to do the, all the setups is here linked to the, to the presentation that will be available to you later. And yeah, for this case with the FreeBSD is the same setup as I mentioned in the in the first talk. I use the. I'm I'm pretty sure that I'm I'm putting all the main pages here, but I'm not telling you or people watching the stream that only by reading the main page you will be the expert. Just please read the main page, break things. You have the resources, then you will learn it. So, yeah. Is, is a reference for uh, everything. And yeah, maybe before asking something, go to the main page first. Um, yeah, quick mention to the BSD install. Uh, it uses the BSD config uh, utility that you can use to set up your accounts, this partitioning network, time date, and other uh, CCTL knobs, and so on and so off. So uh, it's kind of the front end and the back end thing for understanding of that. So here, by default, is uh, etc slash install.cfg, which is the file containing the variables and your setup. So the preamble and the setup that you want to auto install your FreeBSD. So this will be the file that I mentioned that you can, for the FreeBSD example, inject into your ISO image or your main stick. You don't need to do this uh, IPX thing if you don't want to. So this is an example of that. The, the, the first part, the preamble, and then the setup part. 
This is mandatory because the, the, the scripts that the installer uses will basically just split the then in two and then you have the the auto installation of a very basic uh, FreeBSD machine with uh, this host name uh, starting SSH and doing um, NTPD for FreeB for uh, PFSense that's uh, also based on the FreeBSD and the same case for TrueNAS all the projects are based on FreeBSD so uh, a lot of people were asking about uh, how we can auto install it and rescue uh, the configuration file from before. So, in short, you can fetch it from a remote location and just subscribe it. But I pointed to this location here that you can have a little better understanding of how they do this. Uh, when you have like a disks on the same machine and you are searching for the backup configuration on a different disk. So that file will give people uh, better guidance on where to write the configuration file and what kind of patterns do you see when you look for a configuration file. Um, by default, the config XML uh, SH will not fetch everything for you, restore backup. You just use that as a reference. And yeah, by the time of this uh, slides, I used the development version from uh, 2.7, and now 2.7 is uh, released already. And the, the, the two changes that I see here from the, from the very vanilla FreeBSD setup is uh, they had this uh, TMP build room uh, file that you can just cat, touch, put something there, that they check it uh, before doing the auto installation. And in, instead of uh, install.cfg, you have the installer config for them. It's just a difference from, from the versions of used. And um, yeah, you can also uh, read in the code uh, from the PFC reposit uh, PFSense repository, uh, get the references from what they use in part mode here. Uh, if you need to use this uh, force uh, boot method, you, you set it here in the preamble and it will auto-install it for you. Or you can extend that and put more things in here and there, like let's say fetch your configuration file, base it on let's say the Mac of the machine or serial from, I don't know, pick your choice of uh, differentiating from which configuration you need. So here you see the same uh, mandatory thing that from here, you have um, the setup part of it. For uh, TrueNAS, um, that was fun. They, yeah, long they come from the, the FreeNAS and they use this uh, avatar project for some reason. They have this, some Python uh, and installers. They use a very different approach, not really the the BSD install, BSD config. They have uh, install.sh and uh, install.conf in a totally different format. But again, open source, you can get that from the repository over there. And it's very simple configuration file that you can write to, to auto install it. The big difference here for me was uh, with the ISO image, they ship a memory disk and you will need to extract that memory disk, mount it, which for my case, I was using this uh, NFS partition to boot the file system and everything. So I needed to get uh, the memory disk root and point to the, to, the, to the correct partition. Here are the references from the mem page, and here are the reference to mem pages of tools that they use to build the memory disk, which is the thing that I use uh, to build my uh, ELK uh, solution. In short, once you have the memory disk um, mounted, you extract the things from the memory disk, put your uh, own file systems, mount that as your root partition, and then you just uh, inject the install.conf, which looks like this. 
like a password, uh, password adding clear tags in the configuration file, but yeah, it's all good. And now ELK uh, is a reference from the name of the acronym, which means encrypted and lovely cage environment. I needed to build a fancy name. Uh, once again, I used the BSD install and BSD config as a reference, looking on the source code, how it auto installs. Um, you know, like when you're installing the FreeBSD, you can just hit the auto UFS or ZFS uh, partition scheme. So I use that as a reference to know where uh, do I need to put the EFI partition, the FreeBSD boot partition and all that. So I use that as a reference. Again, main pages all over. And for me, I had like this uh, two different uh, words. And so to say, let's, let's say I have like this SSH uh, D and the ELK word. For me, I opted to split this thing into a MD uh, file, which I created with uh, MakeFS, compressed it with MK UZIP, and mounted in uh, read-only uh, mode. So once I'm there with this system, I can jump to this one. I'm not sure if some of you attended the talk yesterday about the um, booting FreeBSD with the K-boot. Someone mentioned about the reroute. I use that here. So basically, I got the, 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 the path on how I could do the installation on my own with that reference over there. And I have this uh, two different words here. For the SSHD uh, memory disk that I build, I set that to be non-readable. Uh, I have like some custom uh, things that I want to set the mount point, the geom li I put to zero in a way that when I boot that and FreeBSD detects that I have an encrypted uh, partition there, it doesn't really locks its boot by asking for the passphrase, the password, or whatever. So I can boot to the end of the memory disk with the SSH running. So that was important for me. And yeah, maybe a very few people will use this. Uh, you have this uh, Onion service running there, so you can really access your machine uh, to unlock it remotely. Uh, via Tor on your service and if um, you want to prevent uh, access for the console you put this uh, insecure console mode on TTY so you can only really log in via SSH um, extended uh, features on the ZFS that we can use now with the uh, encrypted data sets here's the main page for her reference so in top of the, on top of the geom uh, Eli partition, I have this encrypted uh, ZFS root partition, and then I have the data sets. So you will build a chain of uh, unlock uh, procedures that you will achieve when you go through the um, memory disk image. So uh, this is the thing that I, I use. It. This is the BSD config. If someone never saw that, this is a little overview of what um, proof of concept, which is actually the, the setup that I have at home, uh, looks like. I have like the, the FreeBSD boot partition, EFI partition, the uh, UFS, ZFS partitions, and here in um, 350 megabytes, it's the, the UZIP image that I mount in read-only mode. Decompress it, it gets like a one gigabyte. So with that, uh, I build, again, the SSHD and the ELK uh, environments. The SSHD is the memory disk read-only partition, and the ELK is my thing, which has my credentials, whatever that, like 
uh, SSH, private key, the things that I do use to do like git commits. Anyway, it's, it's my remote machine. Uh, to unlock that, you verify, uh, then you pick like a, uh, your needs. So if you want to be sure that you're connecting to the, to the correct machine, you just don't blindly, <laughs> as a lot of people do, just accept every kind of uh, hash when you're SSHing to a machine. So when you do the first setup, you put the hash of the, let's say, SSH uh, key scan into your Git repository locally in your laptop. So you compare that using, let's say, minus O, uh, user no files, and use that as a reference. So you know that you're really connecting to the uh, correct machine. Or you can, again, as I put it, the, the main pages as a reference, you can build your SSH D config to support only certain types or ciphers, uh, hash algorithms and whatever. So you, before connecting in your uh, unlock script, you can verify if the host uh, has the same um, keys, if the ciphers that you set up uh, are the ciphers that you expect that machine has, uh, and so on and so on. So we can also combine proxy commands to jump to a machine, and from that machine you do the SSH command to the machine you want to unlock. Um, compare the SSH fingerprint also with the DNS record that you can put the DNSSEC here, whatever, and be sure that you're jumping to the correct machine. Um, you will need to use like KLD load to load the ZFS modules, which you do not want to load uh, by default, or uh, do the GLI load to unlock the GLI partition. Uh, use the ZPool import, load keys. Here, if you use the, the um, encrypted data sets, uh, then you see that you will have like a, a chain of dependencies that you need to follow to unlock the really uh, root encrypted partition, which will be this here, the Tangamandapu root uh, partition that you want to mount. So the last step will be with KN, you set the variable from the mount, mount from, and then you just reroute into that. So you jump from the read-only uh, memory disk file into the um, root encrypted uh, partition that you have. Reroot. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's just the one page. Yeah, yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, my mistake, maybe. Yeah, is the um, reboot minus uh, R, I think. So here's the console of the uh, MD file, which is encrypted, and you have like nothing running there, just this very default SSH service that you can only uh, log in via SSH because your uh, custom needs blocked the persons that could log in in front of the machine. So if you have that theoretically in a data center, so theoretically, if someone has the password, they could try to theoretically log in without you knowing, but it, they will either pop up some login information, but they will be able to use the machine without the SSH credentials. So for this example, uh, that's not possible because I blocked uh, the logging via uh, console, and they can only log in via SSH. And this is the case. There was uh, SSH. There was a 14.0 current, only NTP, and SSH running, like nothing besides that. And from this machine, which again, the environment here is the uh, read-only uh, MD file, the compressed one. And from here, I can um, jump to the other uh, system. Cool questions. I'm talking too fast. Man. Yeah, because last time I, I was scared to like getting like one hour and blocking everybody for lunch, so you can get a a fino 
in a few. For the demos, I put it here because I didn't really want to spend some time showing you the the whole thing, but I have the, the, the videos I can show you. Yeah, I'm not familiar with IT uh, change. So you said you can change the previous EDI fix or something and it isn't your own uh, CA certificate. Yeah. No. The DACP points to the what's the name of that uh, oh, you server? Yeah. 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 From the from the DACP to get the the server that will serve you the IPixie yeah. and then you kind of jump from one to the other one. If you cannot do this, uh, IPixie can do that for uh, via HTTPS uh, and you can, if you want to have, uh, let's say, an edge yeah. proxy, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so what you get is uh, a very small IPC chain over TFTP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The IPC environment can boot HTTP, even not more smaller than not HTTPS and all that. So uh, and and reach entry points, uh, the old fix might not even can reach. Mm -hmm. So you could download a modern kernel over TFTP if that works, and you're not getting lots of packets. So yeah. Uh, then you could still have problems that your kernel entry Chains of booting, yeah. The 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 number of features from from what we get from IPixie is huge. Is huge. Uh, for example, also the, the the default Pixie boot from FreeBSD only supports TFTP and NFS, so we cannot really just point to an HTTP normal HTTP address and boot from that. And yeah, that for me kind of. Um, broke my legs so to say uh, when I was trying to do this booting via HTTP in a very old machine which didn't have the support already um, here I can so we have Yeah, it's okay. It's just booting the PFSense. It will auto install it. You can you can ask. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with the FreeBSD way of installing stuff. So for me, it was hard to follow where the line is between the official installer features, and with, say, supported way, for example, and the edit infrastructure that came from you on top. Can you explain this a little bit? Where, how much of this is a custom setup of yours? The part from my custom setup, I would say that's 90% in, in a way that I, the only reference that I have is BSD config, which I can use to do the, to wipe the disks and then start my thing. Because um, the tools are there, but they don't, they don't really, it's a, maybe a very specific setup to have this uh, remote unlock uh, possibility to do this with your machine but um, yeah from 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 freebsd i got only the the only bsd config and bsd install which is the the default installer and you go through the part where you do the disk partitioning i kind of stop there and the, the rest i do on my own
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The default one you can also like escape to a to a terminal to a show and then call it again just passing the script as a parameter and then you you do it. Yeah, this is just auto installing the the TrueNAS. Here you you hit the the, the point of uh, install the dot sh. They basically just hammer the, the the hard drive and and do the installation. The video is a little weird. Yeah, now it's just hang it like writing the the system. Let's just skip that to here or here. Ah, there. Yeah, it's a video of everything. It was just easy for me. Like, yeah. Ah, no, it's not uh, VirtualBox, it's a uh, Virt Manager. So it's a uh, KVM. Yeah, there is just booting the, the, the system that just got installed. I didn't know you could put the QM installed. It's great, great Yeah. And you can install that in a VM, but a lot of people have problems with that, but it works. Which is <laughs> this presentation. I didn't even try on ARM, to be honest, but it should work. <laughs> I make my own, I generate the key pair, I generate the SSHD config, I write to the to the root, uh, to, to the temporary thing, and then I do the MAKFS and then compress it. Yes. Yeah, sort of it, yeah. Correct. So you could, of course, ask, you know, with the space, uh, ask a very small uh, space and put all in there. Yeah, I, I, I kind of do that. I strip all the man page, uh, C-Lang, everything just for space purpose, the sizing purpose. Then I build the MD file, compress it, and then... Uh, 350 megabytes. Does it include the installation steps? No, no. No, this is what I installed. This is the MD after the, the installation. So with the installation sets, this is a, that is a, the the tar balls. That is different. Yeah. Have you considered NFS use? No. Ah, yeah, the, 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 the boot thing from Matru. Yeah, the, 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 the I don't remember that. I use it as a I use it as a reference. And it was in the previous slide. Yeah. You gotta use an FS USB because also the that boot pulls basically layers of uh, compressed uh, file system, uh, compressed file system and uh, then breaking it was down to uh, Yeah, yeah, but, but, but 
I think when he started that, we couldn't really have all all the support that we have uh, today. So the last part here is that um, our friend uh, Jorge Irado uh, from the FreeBSD community and open source community in Brazil, uh, he passed away like uh, in 2011. So when I started this, I kind of uh, was the anniversary of 10 years that he passed it. So I would just dedicate that to him. So. The, the motto of Irado was, um, I'm not giving you here the commands that you can just run. It will work for you, and then you'll learn a shit. But he was like pretty direct on that. So was not flaming, like having big discussions on mailing lists, nothing like that. He was uh, a very nice dude, um, giving people the right guidance so they can learn and implement their solution themselves without being so lazy. So I also learned a lot from them. So that's it. And there we are. I would love to do that. That's some just NDAs involved. That is some like a, another case with a little script that allows you to jump from release to stable to current without compiling everything. Also NDA on that. Yeah. Thank you.